because we don't get lung function data on kids or young adults normally, they had to get all the data from studies where it was something done as part of research. But they put together data from three large population-based studies. And shockingly, what they figured out was that of all the patients that get chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is one of the most common adult lung conditions, only half of them got it because they had this rapid lung function decline in adulthood. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hey friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today, I sit down with Dr. Mei Lan Han. Dr. Han is Professor of Medicine and Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care at the University of Michigan, a spokesperson for the American Lung Association, and the author of Breathing Lessons, A Doctor's Guide to Lung Health. In this conversation, we talk about COVID-19 and its impact on the respiratory system, how common lung conditions are, the effects of smoking and vaping on lung health, healthy habits during pregnancy to promote healthy lung development, pollution and particulate matter, how we can reduce our exposure to toxic compounds in the air around us, and plenty more. Okay, here we are, Dr. Mei Lan Han. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you join us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Firstly, I must say congratulations on your new book. I'm holding it here, Breathing <laughs> Lessons. It's uh, very, very timely, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into. Uh, I think you've done a, a wonderful job um, shedding light on an area of health that as you say, has been overlooked and somewhat neglected relative to other aspects of our health for, for a long time. So I've, I've really enjoyed reading it. I also listened to the audio book, which I believe you've read that yourself, right? I did. I did. Yes. And uh, I've, I've done that. That's a, it's a fun process to go through. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious, before we sort of get into the nitty gritty here, around the timing of this book, the book came out earlier this year, and of course, uh, you do feature COVID-19 in it. Right. And I, I'm wondering, were you already writing and planning a book pre-COVID, or was it the fact that COVID-19 sort of shone a light on the importance of our lungs that left you thinking, hmm, the world's actually quite interested in my area of expertise? Well, it is kind of a, a, a fun story, so thanks for asking. So I am a pulmonologist at the University of Michigan. I actually took over as chief of the, the whole sort of division of pulmonary and critical care uh, at the beginning of this year, but for many years I've been involved with the American Lung Association, so I've sort of had a heart for advocacy for a long time. And it was, I have to be honest with you, a pretty snoozy job for a long time. And then right before the pandemic, so late 2019, early 2020, uh, we started having uh, outbreaks of uh, adolescents and young adults who were getting really, really sick from vaping. Mm -hmm. And it, and uh, if you remember the sort of the E Valley and that that crisis, and that was actually where we were at right before uh, news started coming out of Wuhan that that uh, that there was a concerning virus uh, on the loose. And then right uh, sort of at the end of end of March, beginning of April, right when we were sort of moving into lockdown and we were worried about ventilators, I had the opportunity to do a different podcast, which was Freakonomics. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I got to talk to people about how their lungs worked and how mechanical ventilators were helping keep people alive. And uh, a publisher in New York uh, heard it uh, from Norton Publishing, uh, my editor, Matt Wayland. And he actually reached out and he said, hey, you know, you actually did a reasonably good job explaining to people how their lungs work. And I looked and there's no book out there <laughs> that actually, you know, really takes people through this in a, in a sort of science-based way. And so mm -hmm. I actually, once we got, Michigan was at the front of the first surge. And after we got through the, that first surge in the summer of 2020, when we were in a bit of a lull, I took 12 weeks and wrote the book. So that's mm. kind of how it happened. I had had in, a lot of stuff, I think, in my mind beforehand, 
but uh, this really was the the impetus and uh, that that got me going. But I do have to say uh, that I actually learned quite a bit in in writing the book. There's some of the stuff I knew, but honestly, some of the stuff mm. I actually uh, had to do a lot of research on. So it, it's yeah. really honestly shaped and framed a lot of my thinking moving forward. It's incredible to to think about how important the respiratory system is, yet how surface level most of most of our, our knowledge actually is. You know, I can put my hand up and, and I've been through a Bachelor of Science degree and learned about the anatomy and physiology and that was a decade ago, um, but I'd forgotten most of that. And, you know, other than the, the, the fact that our lungs help us bring oxygen into the body and clear carbon dioxide and that smoking is bad, um, you know, the extent of, of our kind of general knowledge doesn't go much further than that. And I think you did a fantastic job just sh- illustrating how important this system is and what we can do to really set ourselves up for success and sort of think about prevention rather than just treatment of lung conditions. I, I really enjoyed that approach and I'm hoping we can dig into some of that stuff. Take us back a little bit though first. What did your personal journey look like into medicine and and what was it that that sort of took you down the path of specializing in pulmonology so i you know i am guessing you've got listeners for this podcast all over the world so for those of you not familiar with the united states i grew up in idaho believe it or not which most people have not met someone that grew up there it's uh, not very populated <laughs> mm. and uh, i lived in a pretty rural area growing up uh, and I actually got interested in medicine because I had a high school teacher that said, you know, I think you might be good at it. And so I started uh, looking into it. And I had some, a really fun opportunity to volunteer in a local emergency room. I don't know if they have this in Australia, but in the United States, we used to call them candy stripers. So mm-hmm. if you got to volunteer, uh, I was a candy striper. And uh, and then I, you know, went to undergraduate. And the more I, I found out about medicine, the more I liked it, ended up doing medical school at the University of Washington in Seattle because Idaho does not have a medical school. And as part of that experience, did a lot with rural health. And I really thought I was going to, you know, sort of serve my state and go back and and kind of be a, a jack of all trades. And But in medical school, I got interested in pulmonary medicine and ultimately ended up doing a residency at the University of Michigan in uh, in Michigan. I, I thought I was going to go back, but I ended up staying for fellowship. And then I got interested in research and I never left. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the things about medicine that's been really fun for me has been that it's had a lot of um, bends in the road. So I've, I have pivoted and changed sort of what I do a lot of times, and that's kind of kept it fun for me. But I, part of the reason that I, I a lot of people go into pulmonary and critical care medicine because they really like the ICU. So it's very exciting to take care of patients that are critically ill. It's moment by moment decisions. Uh, you get to do a lot of procedures. You get to use all the stuff you learned in medical school and really take care of patients in a very fast paced and intense setting. Mm-hmm. And so I think like many, that is in part what drew me to the profession. But as I've been uh, in the profession for over 20 years now, I think that I have also learned to love taking care of my patients that I get to see on a daily basis outside the hospital or outside the inpatient setting and have really honestly developed kind of a passion for trying to help patients find a voice because at least in the United States, many of the patients with chronic lung disease come from rural and socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. And, uh, uh, or, you know, if you look at, at, at asthma and children, children often are not, are not really in a position to be advocates for themselves. So, um, I've, it's been really important to me in the last few years to try to figure out how we can advocate for more funding, for better treatments, et cetera, for, for patients with respiratory mm-hmm. disease. So that's sort of kind of what set me up for where I was right before the pandemic started. What is it that, that, uh, increases the likelihood of of experiencing a chronic lung condition if you're uh, less privileged or in a low socioeconomic population? 
Well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, there obviously are things like smoking, which uh, a lot of people, you know, just rush to blame. Uh, unfortunately, though, a, a lot of lung disease uh, is also not related to smoking as well. But that that that's certainly one part of it. But if you think about who, you know, really got sick with the first wave uh, of the pandemic, it's a lot of the frontline workers, right? So it's uh, uh, people that are vulnerable are going to be those that are exposed to um, have occupational exposures or working dusty jobs or, you know, dirty jobs or they're in factories where there's a lot of, of, of chemical exposures. Or even if you think, you know, there's even how uh, people that do, uh, you know, janitorial work or hairdressers, nail technicians, it's the blue collar jobs that mm. often expose people to things that hurt you know, hurt their lungs. And, and I, I think that that's a huge piece of why patients with chronic lung disease, um, you know, often come from uh, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged backgrounds because of the kinds of, of work they end up doing. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone is hearing pulmonary medicine for the first time, the word pulmonary or pulmonologist, um, I'm, I'm just conscious that maybe that, that's the first time that's come up. Um, I guess folks listening with a chronic lung condition or, uh, you know, if they have asthma, may be familiar with this area of medicine. But if it's the first time you're hearing that, what does pulmonary mean? And, and what is the role of a pulmonologist within the healthcare system? Right. So I think that you're right. It can be very confusing for people. We have all these fancy names and we've broken down the, the whole body into very <laughs> specific little pieces and doctors that study very tiny bits of it. So uh, so pulmonologists, also called respirologists, depending on where you live, uh, uh, take care of patients with lung conditions. But, you know, to be honest, we have to remember that the lungs are part of a greater system and that one thing can impact the other. Uh, it's obviously directly connected to the heart and, and the bloodstream, uh, and but it also does a lot of other vital stuff for us besides just breathe, right? When we say breathe, most people think about, okay, well, the lungs get oxygen in for me, and that's probably sort of where their mind sort of stops. Uh, but uh, the lungs also get carbon dioxide out, which is a waste product of metabolism. So when you exercise or, or walk or do anything, that's a necessary waste product that the that the lungs are getting rid of for us. Uh, but the the lungs also play a key role in um, helping to regulate acid base balance for the for the body. Uh, that the kidneys can do that on the longer term, but the lungs are important for doing that on on the shorter term. So. There's a lot of important things that uh, that the lungs do, but the but lung doctors in general, at least uh, in the United States, we tend to do both uh, caring for patients with either acute lung problems like pneumonia, chronic lung problems like uh, asthma, but we also take care of patients that end up uh, in the hospital very sick from lung conditions like COVID-19 and patients that end up on needing mechanical ventilators mm. to, to try to support their breathing in the hospital. And earlier I kind of alluded uh, to the fact that for, for a while there, this area of medicine um, seems to have been somewhat overlooked or, or neglected compared to some of the other um, conditions. And I know that you, you write about that. I'm interested in, in hearing from you on, on why you think that is the case. You know, how, how prevalent are these, these, particularly these chronic lung conditions relative to other chronic diseases like say cardiovascular disease, um, for example? And why is it that you, you think the lung conditions in particular have got a little bit less airtime? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question. I knew it to be true for a long time, but I really dug in to try to sort it out for the book mm -hmm. and understand and kind of come to grips with it myself. So, you know, I honestly think that it goes way, way, way back. So I talk about this in the book, but, you know, the spirometer was actually invented way before uh, things like the stethoscope and the blood pressure cuff. But we didn't, I, it was a large clunky machine and doctors really didn't get excited about using it. You have to remember that in the early 1900s, we didn't have evidence-based medicine. We had mm -hmm. sort of, you know, uh, whatever doctors sort of felt like medicine. Uh, and uh, doctors really liked stethoscopes and they liked 
blood pressure cuffs and they could carry them easily in their bags and impress wealthy clients. And, and, and the funny thing is because it was prevalent to use those items and not to use the big clunky spirometer that required, you know, water and, and tubing and not something you could easily put in your bag, uh, you know, we ended up getting a lot of blood pressure measurements early on. And then ultimately we figured out, we had enough data points that we could figure out that it actually was associated with, uh, you know, important outcomes like strokes and heart attacks. And, and we could then, you know, dig in on trying to prevent it. The funny thing is that the gentleman that, that it was credited Hutchinson with developing sort of the early prototype for the spirometer, he was actually an actuary for, uh, an insurance company, and he developed it because he knew it predicted uh, lifespan. But uh, it just it just never caught on and never got the evidence basis. I, and uh, and so we've sort of just lagged for a really, really long time. And I think it's a it's a combination of that. I think it's a combination of who the patients are, and maybe they haven't felt in a position, there's a lot of stigma, for instance, associated with smoking, and they haven't felt comfortable speaking up for themselves. Uh, and uh, and so I think it's 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 just been uh, the other issue is that and I will place some blame on lung doctors and and so if you think about uh, I, a lot of your listeners probably don't know this but there are technical ways of doing a lot of things and if you're going to do a perfect blood pressure measurement you're supposed to sit somebody down and have them rest for 10 to 15 minutes in a quiet room you're supposed to take the measurement three times you average the measurement. And if you were going to do it for a clinical trial, that's what you would do. But we never do that in the doctor's office, right? I bet I bet almost everybody uh, listening to this podcast has A, had their blood pressure checked, and B, never had it checked that way, right? <laughs> well, for a lung function, lung doctors have held how we do it to a really high standard, kind of that same standard for blood pressure, but we actually do hold people to that standard for the breathing tests, and you have to do it three times, and it has to be reproducible, and and so I think while the measurements themselves have ended up being very, very good, it has meant that not as many people do them because it's, you know, a lot of family doctors have thought, well, you know what, the, the bar is just too high. It's just too much to deal with. And so I think it's a combination of all of these things that has sort of made uh, lung disease not get very much attention, interest, focus, funding, uh, and and I really believe, I've been trying to grapple with my, you know, in my own mind, how it is that we could enter a respiratory pandemic and have so many millions of individuals die and really be caught so unprepared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the American Lung Association calculated that deaths from lung issues was actually the number one cause of death. Uh, last year in the United States, and if you look at uh, if you look at historically, cardiovascular disease, yes, it, it is a major cause of death. But the causes, of, but it's been dropping and dropping and dropping. And lung disease, even before the pandemic, was roughly third leading cause of death in the world for children. Death for pneumonia is one of the top killers of children under five. So it's not like it's a small problem, uh, mm. but it just. Uh, has, you know, for a variety of reasons, has just not gotten as much attention. And I truly believe that undiagnosed lung inflammation, lung injury, and lung disease contributed to the huge variation in illness severity that we saw with COVID-19. You know, that was a huge thing at the beginning of the pandemic. Why is so-and-so getting so sick? Why is this other person not getting sick at all? And, and I really believe that, uh, and there's studies to back this up, that, that, lung injury, lung inflammation, and undiagnosed lung disease really did contribute to some of that variation that we saw. So I've got a couple of questions on that. So it sounds like you can have a lung condition and be unaware of it. Um, oh, absolutely. At least not be formally diagnosed. So I want to I kind of better understand that. And also, you mentioned the spirometer. And this gets me thinking, if, if we were to to, to say be better at screening and diagnosing these conditions earlier in the piece and therefore being able to better manage them and prevent them from progressing. What, what would that, that sort of screening look like? Would it be tools like the spirometer or what would a, a, a kind of um, prevention or early detection program look like? 
So to answer your first question, are there patients out there that have lung disease and do not know it? Absolutely. So the most common lung condition is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, at least in adults. And uh, the estimates suggest about half of all di- all patients who have it don't know they have it. Half. Wow. Uh, so, and it is not uncommon for me to see somebody walk into my office. And I'm not talking about all 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds. I'm talking about 30 and 40-year-old women that have walked into my office and gotten a breathing test for the first time and found out that their lungs were severely impaired and had no idea. Maybe they smoked for 15 years growing up or they had some other other issue. You know, the other kind of interesting um, piece of information that came to light right before the pandemic is this. We used to think that the, the sort of the, the mental model the doctors were working on for many years, including myself, when I came out of medical school and started my early training, was this. Almost everybody makes it to adulthood with a relatively healthy pair of lungs. I mean, I wouldn't know if my lungs were wrong. Like, nobody ever said anything, right? Mm. Uh, and But then, you know, due to dirty air and infection and, you know, insults that we accrue over time, some people have more rapid lung function decline, and that's how people get sick. And that's what we thought for a really, really long period of time. Until this kind of groundbreaking study got published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. And because we don't get lung function data on kids or young adults normally, they had to get all the data from studies where it was something done as part of research. But they put together data from three large population-based studies. And shockingly, what they figured out was that of all the patients that get chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is one of the most common, again, adult lung conditions, only half of them got it because they had this this rapid lung function decline in adulthood. The other half never hit peak lung function in adulthood, which means given the fact that there are, you know, just in the U.S. alone, uh, I apologize, I do not have all the figures for every country on the top of my head, but in the U.S. alone, we have roughly 30 million individuals with COPD, of which 15 million are undiagnosed. But if you, let's say we take 30 million individuals, that means half of those individuals, millions of people, mm. are experiencing impaired lung growth, lung development before they ever hit adulthood. And nobody knows about it because we never look. And so there are many people that probably don't have the super healthy pair of lungs that they think they have going into adulthood. And and I really think that if people had that information, they would make better choices. So for as example, I just saw an individual in my office who is a young gentleman and had you know, came in because he was short of breath playing basketball with his buddies, couldn't really keep up. You know, I started asking about his history and started vaping a couple of years ago. And, but when I really dug into his history, I found out he was premature. He had a bunch of breathing problems when he was a child. He'd been lost to follow up. Nobody had ever checked his lung function. And here he was, he came into my office and he had about half normal lung function, half at like 19. And I think if he had known that, he probably would have made different choices. He probably wouldn't have started vaping at, at, at 15 or 16. So that brings us to your second question, which is screening. What do we do about it? So this is a huge area of frustration for me because, uh, yes, I absolutely am a huge believer in evidence-based medicine. But, you know, every year the, the, the groups that kind of make statements about, about screening and, and as I'm sure you know, we get our, lots of arguments every year about who should get mammograms, who should get their their you know prostate antigens checked, who should get colon cancer screening, right? So it's the same thing, but they come out year after year saying no screening for lung disease because we don't have any evidence to show that it it alters outcomes. But it's but the important part there is that it's not negative evidence; it's lack of evidence because nobody's actually ever done the studies to figure out if we actually knew if people had uh, impaired lung function, uh, you know, that we could actually alter it. Now they the the part of it is they keep saying, "Well, there's nothing we as physicians would do differently. We would just tell people live a healthy lifestyle." Don't smoke. You know, that's not going to change. But where I come in, I believe that people might make different decisions if they knew. They might make different life choices uh, if they knew. So this is really, I think, an active area of debate in the medical community right now. So you said that that patient of yours had half the normal lung function. 
And right. earlier you mentioned the spirometer. Is that right. is that as measured by when you say a breath test? Right. Is that what a spirometer right. is? So we have a couple of different, uh, you know, breathing tests that we can do. The mm. most common, and thank goodness, it does not require the inverted bell water trap setup that it used to. <laughs> it now is is done with, you know, pretty fancy electronic equipment, uh, and it's very easy to do in the office. But essentially, you have people blow air out, and and it and when we look at how much air you can get out and the rate at which you can get air out, it can tell us. Uh, the, the simple spirometer can tell us, first, it's a good screening for things like asthma and CPD where you have a hard time getting air out. If we are worried about patients not being able to get enough air in and lung capacity, we can infer that from the spirometer. But the best test is an even fancier test called plethysmography where we actually put people in what looks like an old-fashioned telephone booth mm. and we can get fancier measurements. But spirometry is always sort of the, our first go-to because it's easy, it's quick, it's widely available. So if there's anybody out there mm. listening and you are wondering if you're, you have an issue or uh, even worse, if you've talked to your doctor and they've blown you off and they've said, oh, you're fine, or they've given you a diagnosis of something and they've never actually checked your lung function, that is absolutely something is within your right to ask for, is to ask for spirometry. Mm -hmm. And are there kind of typical like reference, there's a reference range of where you want yes. to fall? What kind of numbers would, would a sp spirometry uh, or a spirometer test sort of um, give us if, if we were, if we had normal lung function Lungs. versus abnormal? Suboptimal. So the right, so the lungs can hold several liters of air. So it's going to be, you know, the numbers are going to be in several liters. But in order to adjust for the fact that men and women have different lung sizes, and old and young, mm. and tall and short, we actually have um, normative equations. So mm. that you'll you'll breathe into the test, but you'll get a number out that'll say percent predicted. So you want to be like between eighty and hundred percent predicted. When you get a, a a cold, like let's say you have a viral. Um, respiratory infection or a bacterial respiratory infection, what sort of, do you see a decline in, in, in that figure if you were to test someone? You know, we sometimes do. We don't always. Part of the problem is when patients are uh, in the middle of uh, a cold or an infection, it, they have a really hard time doing the test. Mm -hmm. So we have a hard time getting good measurements uh, during tests. But if you do a much simpler test, which is something called a peak flow meter, which is a tube you just breathe into and uh, which we often will use with asthma patients. We do will see a drop in the peak flow uh, uh, during uh, a um, uh, during an infection or what we call an exacerbation for patients that have chronic lung conditions. So it's interesting. There are actually a whole bunch of companies right now that are very interested in wearables and Fitbits and I, you know, and watches as to whether changes in respiratory rate or changes in oxygen, you know, how can we pick up on whether someone's having a problem, you know, earlier and better? And there's a lot of research that's going on to that right now. I don't think we've necessarily settled on one, mm -hmm. you know, one thing is being being the best, but there's a lot of ways that potentially in the future we might be able to use to pick up on early signs of something going wrong. So if someone is kind of listening and, and no doubt throughout this conversation, we're going to talk about some of the, the potential risk factors or things in the environment that may affect lung function. But if someone's thinking, I'd love to to just objectively understand where is my lung function at, or maybe they're thinking about their child's lung function, it, is what you're suggesting is to to visit your doctor and to do a few of these routine tests as a kind of first step? So, you know, it's... <laughs> The doctors often will not order it unless you've got a symptom. And that is sort of one thing that's a little bit frustrating uh, for me right now. Um, I suspect in the next few years, they are developing more and more uh, uh, machines that probably people can do at home and maybe hook up with the uh, iPhone and things like that. None of those are really considered quote unquote standardized. So, uh, but you know, if you're having even the slightest symptom or concern, I think you can certainly chat with your doctor. It's not something we're doing routinely as part of like health maintenance right now. But I think if you talk to your doctor and you can um, explain, you know, if you've got specific risk factors or you have specific reasons to be concerned, I personally don't think it's it's unreasonable, mm -hmm. you know, to ask. I do think as a, 
as a health system, we should be checking people a lot earlier and a lot younger, particularly like this gentleman. He had a clear history of something going wrong. He really should have had it checked. So it'll be up to, you know, if you have zero risk factors, no history, no symptoms, they may not, you know, they may not want to do it. Uh, but but really, um, I, I think the number of patients who probably deserve to have it is much broader than who are currently getting mm. it. Tell me about the the fallout since COVID nineteen, and I realize the dust hasn't fully settled, and and you know we 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 don't have sort of real long term data, but with what we currently understand, has this virus been less damaging than you predicted early on, or just as you predicted, or more damaging than you predicted in terms of lung function? I think we are are still learning. So we have millions of individuals across the world now with long haul COVID. And what we're finding is a huge spectrum of abnormalities in these patients. So uh, we have some patients who have shortness of breath where we actually can't find something objectively wrong with the lungs. And these patients may have nerve damage or other like just like low lying inflammation with the virus hiding out somewhere causing systemic inflammation. They may have heart issues, et cetera. So there's a lot there we don't know. For patients that were really severely sick, like in the hospital, maybe on the ventilator, we're seeing sort of very characteristic signs of of the kind of damage we would have expect with non-COVID illnesses. Uh, we saw that again, even, even before COVID, when patients would get really sick and have bad pneumonias or on the ventilator. But what is interesting to me are those patients that are sort of in the middle ground. The patients that didn't get in the hospital, so maybe we have no information. They never actually went to the doctor, or maybe they were just briefly seen in the ER and sent home. And, uh, and that is a really a mixed bag of individuals. There are some that we're seeing subtle abnormalities on. There's even a group of patients I, uh, where we're beginning to wonder if it's uh, attacked not just the what, what I'm going to call the lung parenchyma, which is sort of the spongy gas exchange part of the lungs, but also attach, attacked the lung airways. Uh, which is when those get kind of inflamed and twitchy, that's where we see things like asthma. And we call that obstructive lung disease because the air doesn't flow in and out of the lungs as well. And I'm even seeing patients who maybe, for instance, had some mild asthma before they they contracted COVID. And now they have really horrible, hard to control asthma with much worsening of the of the airway exam on, on CT scan. So we're really seeing a very broad spectrum of abnormalities uh, in patients. So there is definitely an unexpected component there. Is the the risk of uh, long-term lung damage from COVID-19 different depending on whether someone was vaccinated prior to infection? Do we know anything about that? Well, absolutely vaccination influences severity of illness. So uh, during the first wave, but like waves one and two before we had uh, widespread vaccination, uh, we would see all sorts of individuals hospitalized from young to old. You know, it just was indis- in some ways almost felt indiscriminate. Uh, after vaccination, it was very rare for someone to end up in the hospital with the severest forms of infection unless they, A, didn't get vaccinated or B, had immunocompromising conditions such that the vaccine probably didn't work as well as we would have hoped. Uh, so absolutely, the, the severity of lung illness and for many, many patients is directly correlative to how bad the infection was, how bad it affected their lungs, how much oxygen they were on, you know, whether they needed the mm-hmm. ventilator. And absolutely, we've seen a huge drop in that with vaccination. And now it's just, it's these, the unvaccinated as well as the immunocompromised that are getting the the se- severe illnesses now. Can you uh, walk us through the difference between normal breathing and being on a ventilator? You've mentioned ventilator yeah. a few times there, and and I think this was discussed a lot. Um, and of course, putting someone onto a ventilator is not a sort of d- decision made lightly. There's right. a, there's a reason for that. I'm. I think maybe it actually might make sense for us to take one step yeah. back and sort of do a bit of a respiratory system 101, how we breathe, and then how how that is a little different to say being on a ventilator. So I think the first thing I will say is I think for many people, both lung issues and things like mechanical ventilators, we feel like, well, that's somebody else. That's not me. That's not anybody I know. I feel bad for them, but that, you know, doesn't affect me. And 
What I would say is when it comes to mechanical ventilators, I would bet the majority of our listening audience have been on one because when you are in the operating room, this is what we use too. So if you've ever had even minor or major surgery that required you to be on a ventilator, probably during the, you know, during surgery. So that's the first thing to realize is that, you know, this kind of technology and these kinds of issues really are affect everyone. But at when we think about how we normally breathe, so we have a muscle underneath the lungs called the diaphragm. And when it contracts, it uh, flattens out. It normally is shaped like a dome. And when it flattens, the lungs get pulled down. And as the lungs expand, it creates a negative pressure in the lung and air rushes in. So we actually call that negative pressure breathing. And then because the lungs themselves are almost like a rubber band, when the diaphragm relaxes, the, the lungs snap back to their normal resting position and air is, is expelled. So when you have patients, for instance, who have asthma or COPD, what can happen is because the air, air tubes are clogged or um, uh, the um, lung tissue is somewhat destroyed because, and it destroys the elasticity, what can happen is the air gets trapped in the lung. And when the air gets trapped in the lung, what happens is the lungs become too big. And if the lungs become too big, the diaphragm flattens in the resting position, not in the breathing position. And then when you go to breathe, the diaphragm has nowhere to go because it's already flat. It, it can't go down any further. It's already dropped down into sort of its most, most contracted position. And so that is part of the reason why when you have certain kinds of lung diseases, it's really hard to breathe. Now, the other kind of lung disease we can have our scarring conditions, and this is um, in some cases what we're seeing after severe COVID, what happens is the lung becomes just really kind of like a, a super tight rubber band. Like it's it's not even really stretchy. It's just kind of tied up in knots and it gets too small. And then it can be really hard to get the air in because you the, because no matter how hard the diaphragms work, they can't get the lungs to expand to the, to the, the normal size. So that's kind of the general physiology and how things kind of go wrong. And we, we as lung doctors drop things into two big buckets. We call them obstructive lung diseases. And that's kind of that first bucket I was just talking about, which includes asthma and then restrictive lung diseases, which are these scarring conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's kind of how we breathe, but the mechanical ventilator is very different because it's positive pressure breathing. We are physically blowing air into the lungs and therefore you know, forcing the lungs to, to open up and forcing those diaphragms down. It is not a natural way of breathing and it is uncomfortable. And to be honest, some of the um, sort of unintended harm that occurs with putting people on the ventilator is that when we sedate people heavily to allow them to, uh, to uh, tolerate the ventilator because it's so uncomfortable and unnatural, we also, at the same time, take away a lot of the body's natural protective mechanisms mm. to protect your airway and and to just you know and to move and keep your muscles strong and all this other stuff. And so that's those are some of the unintended consequences. The other sort of unintended consequences that we can have when we have patients on ventilators is that, believe it or not, too much oxygen and blowing the lungs up too large actually is quite injurious to the lungs. And so we have to be very, very careful to, to keep the breast the right size, not to force in too much air into the lungs to overinflate them, as well as to not use too much oxygen because that can be actually quite toxic to the lungs. We uh, you know, have to remember we're not breathing pure oxygen on a normal basis. So this is the, this is the balance that doctors are trying to strike when we do have patients that are really sick in the ICU. And if we have no other choice, we have no other choice. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 sometimes it's that or death. Uh, but we, we try to be as careful as possible. Is it the, the sort of bypassing of those natural defense systems that sees someone who is incubated at an increased risk of developing a pneumonia? Is that, is that right? Yes, yes, right. So we've got it. We, we put a tube right past your, you know, your, your epiglottis and everything that would normally, you know, trigger you to cough and keep things from going down into the windpipe. And now we've created this conduit from the, from the yeah. outside right down 
uh, into the lungs. And we've also suppressed your ability to cough or protect your airway in any other way. So yes, mm. it does, uh, uh, every day that a patient's on the ventilator, it does slightly increase the risk for developing an infection. That's something that we're quite mindful of and, and do our best to try to protect mm. people from. But the you know the, the the less time we can have people on ventilators, the better. It also gets me thinking just about general uh, breath in our day-to-day and, and sort of how we're quote unquote meant to breathe and these natural defense systems. Is is there any uh, benefit to say nasal breathing versus mouth breathing? Um, I intuitively would think that breathing through the nose offers some extra filtration. Uh, is there anything to, to that? Well, as far as I know, uh, breathing through the nose is how we were intended to breathe. There is natural filtration both with, you know, the nasal hairs, but, it, you know, if you were to look at the anatomy, there's a lot of kind of tortuous passages that the air has to go through. And we have, there's, uh, you know, there's hair in there to kind of trap and there's a lot of mucous membranes. The other important function of the nasal passage is to humidify air. And that actually um, kind of improves the quality of the air uh, that we breathe. It also, you know, traps infection, dust, particles, all sorts of other things. So, yes, it is true that the, I, I would say, generally speaking, there's a lot of reasons to think that breathing through your nose is, is a healthier way to breathe. Mm-hmm. And just to kind of close the loop, I guess, on the, the kind of basic respiratory system function, can you kind of walk us through the the sort of gas exchange and the overall purpose of of this system and how it kind of sustains life. Sure. I think one of the things that's really confusing for people is sort of the way blood flows through the heart and into the lungs and then out and uh and so maybe it's it's helpful to walk people through that. So Yeah. Uh, you know, blood all pools in the veins and then ultimately it dumps into the right side of the heart. When it enters the right side of the heart, it uh, then enters, uh, it gets pumped into what we call a pulmonary artery. Now, it's a little bit confusing because the terminology for arteries and veins is always arteries uh, are leaving the heart and veins are returning. So people naturally think, okay, well, arteries are have oxygen, right? And veins are the depleted blood. But... In this one case where blood is leaving the heart, entering in the lungs, it's not true. So in this case, we have arteries depleted of blood that are dumping into, into the lung. And what happens is that it starts out with this large, these large pulmonary arteries, but then it gets, the arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, uh, ultimately they, uh, eh, turn into tiny, tiny capillaries. And sorry, these tiny capillaries feed around, I'm sorry, the alveoli. And the alveoli are so thin that uh, it's essentially one cell thick, and then you've got the uh, capillaries, and the, the, bl- uh, the red blood cells then file through, single file. So it, So the oxygen gets in, and the carbon dioxide gets out. That is the the main thing that happens. But in order for all of that to work really well, you've you've got to have, you know, that those if you've got scarring for instance, then all of a sudden that we're not talking about a single cell thick, we're talking about extra stuff. Or let's say you've got fluid in there from a pneumonia. That's all going to impair the ability of oxygen to get in and carbon dioxide to get out. So mm-hmm. so once the the blood goes through and and kind of uh uh, kind of goes through this ins- incredible surface area within the lung. It then pools on the other side in the pulmonary veins. Although this time again, we have this unusual situation where you have veins with highly oxygenated blood. That dumps into the left side of the heart and then gets pumped out to the rest of the body. The lungs are actually one of the few organs in the body that has two blood supplies. So that main blood supply really is in service of the body not the lungs. They do get a little bit from that. There's actually a separate bronchial artery circulation that then feeds, gets the lungs what they actually need uh, to survive and, and to support the lung uh, tissues. But one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that the, the left side of the heart that pumps out blood out to the rest of the body is what we call a high pressure system. So it's used to, you know, the numbers that we see when we get 
our blood pressure taken might be like 120 over 80, something like that, right? On the right side of the heart, it's a much lower pressure system. And the numbers you might see would be like 15 over 10, something like that. So when we have disease, it not only stresses the lungs, it then stresses the heart because the heart's not really set up to try to push. If the resistance builds up because the lungs are diseased and it's harder to push blood through the pulmonary arteries and the right side of the heart starts to fail and then blood actually backs up. And this is sometimes when we can saw like, see like swelling in people's ankles. Not the only reason, but one of the times mm -hmm. when we can see swelling uh, is because of that that heart-lung connection and they're both failing. Okay, so with, with all of this in mind and this kind of appreciation for how this system works and the importance of it, if we're thinking about these chronic lung conditions, uh, including asthma, how important is the sort of development of the, the lungs in utero and in the early stages post-birth in terms of our overall risk of those conditions later in life? Oh, it's, it's hugely important. And, uh, you know, in the book, I really broke, break things down into sort of three phases of where we have to think about how we protect our, either our lungs or that of our children. And so the first phase really is, is development in utero. And there we actually know that things can go wrong. Uh, some of those include maternal exposure. So air pollution, nicotine exposure, uh, they interestingly, there's some data that nicotine exposure in utero causes the airways in the uh, infant to become really long and tortuous. And so if you can think about having airways that are too long and tortuous, what is that going to set you up for? It's going to set you up for airflow obstruction and asthma and wheezing and, and airway conditions, um, you know, moving forward. So, uh, you know, there's actually some interesting data to suggest that, you know, if mothers are having a hard time quitting or, or getting off of nicotine, that vitamin C supplementation can actually help to mitigate, uh, you know, not smoking is best, but but there is some data that that vitamin C can actually help to mitigate some of those risks. But the other thing to remember is that the lungs are not, they're like getting close to prime time, but in some instances aren't really quite ready uh, when the child is born, particularly as we're seeing infants born earlier and earlier. And it's really male infants that are actually at even increased risk because one of the things that has to happen to allow us to breathe is that we've got to make a chemical in the lung called surfactant. Mm -hmm. And surfactant actually lowers the surface tension. Uh, if you think about the air sacs or the alveoli in the lung like little bubbles, uh, if uh, the surface tension in each bubble depends a little bit uh, on not only on the fluid in it, but also the size. And so without surfactant, we'd have all the air rushing into the, the big one, big big pockets and the little ones would have a, would almost never get open. Uh, and so surfactant lowers that and, and allows it, uh, infants to breathe. And when children are born prematurely, um, uh, this is in fact how, um, one of, uh, John F. Kennedy's children died. Uh, they, uh, it used to be called kind of a highland membrane disease of the newborn, but if it's not, if the, if the lungs are not fully prepped, they, uh, patient, babies can go into significant respiratory distress. So we have better treatments for that now. Mm -hmm. We can give artificial surfactant, but, but all of, you know, all of this kind of has to happen, uh, sort of, a, you know, to, to allow for, you know, healthy lungs into the world. And so just, you know, getting good maternal care, delivering child as close to term as possible, actually do a lot to set a child up for, mm -hmm. you know, a lifetime of, of health. It gets me thinking about, I had a, uh, a recent episode with Christina Harris. She's a scientist that's looking at omega-3s and mm. pregnancy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she spoke a lot about the importance of long-chain omega-3 fats, so DHA and EPA found in algae and fatty fish yep. for, for reducing premature pregnancy. And you're, you're speaking there about preterm delivery. Uh, I know there's some evidence that's out there around the consumption of omega-3s and, and reducing that premature pregnancy. It sounds like this is another reason to ensure that you have a good amount of these in, in your diet. 
There's actually some um, interesting data on uh, Mediterranean diets, which is, you know, are high in, in, in uh, omega-3s that um, actually promotes um, healthy lung function in, in infants and children. So uh, not that there's tons of, di- of information out there on diet and the lungs, but the information that there that is there that I could find does support, again, uh, uh, a Mediterranean diet mm-hmm. for, you know, healthy lungs for, for you know, newborns and and moving forward. And, and then there's, you know, so there's a, so that's kind of what I tell, you know, pregnant moms and, and that's sort of my, my thinking there. But then once you move into childhood, there's like, all, there's all sorts of other things to think about from vaccinations to preventing respiratory infections, uh, to just making sure your kids are breathing, you know, healthy air, both within the home and outside the home. And there's all sorts of things there uh, that parents have to be mindful of. Is there any data looking at the the child's diet early in life and their their lung function? Again, the little bit of data that I have seen does kind of again point to sort of the Mediterranean diet being the the best diet. Now I don't know if our listeners out there have children like mine, uh, but my nine year old is not exactly a Mediterranean diet aficionado. <laughs> So I do struggle a little bit. He does like salmon and we're working on things like kale and other things. But uh, but so I know it can be a little bit more of a struggle um, with 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 the little ones. But I think the earlier that you can get those kinds of habits established, the better. Mm-hmm. Work in progress. <laughs> and 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 just quickly to double back, I guess, to, to mom's diet. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned their vitamin C if mm-hmm. someone was smoking. I'm assuming that the smoking incidence of of pregnant women is decreasing? It's not as low in certain countries as you would think. In fact, I think I saw, a, a, you know, in some places it's, I think, as high as a third of of women have some kind of smoke exposure at some point, uh, either right before pregnancy or during pregnancy in certain countries. And, and, you know, and it's not just firsthand smoking, it's secondhand smoking as well. And I know that that can be harder for some women uh, to control. But I think, you know, and, th- and there's also some uh, information also on air pollution. Um, so the, I think, you know, whatever, whatever moms can, t- can do to try to protect the quality of their air is important for health of the infant. Do you think if, if the choice was smoking or vaping, is vaping, and I, I know I'm, I'm making this difficult for you, um, vaping, to my understanding, still contains nicotine, and you spoke uh, before about nicotine, um, but given that it doesn't contain some of the other compounds, is vaping a better option during pregnancy? Ugh. You know, people de- debate this a lot. Obviously, neither is is great. I suppose if you were sub- like somehow could figure out how to smoke the equivalent amount, which is really difficult, right? But somehow, mm-hmm. if you somehow could figure out how to smoke just the exact same amount of combustible cigarette versus of you know vaping liquid, then yes, it is true that there are in some ways. Um, but you know, to be honest, that even with the vaping liquid, when it's when it's burned, it creates thousands and thousands of carcinogens. Um, so it you know, there's less data to suggest that uh, vaping causes things like COPD. Although I think the jury's still out because we don't have as much long term data. But when you're thinking mm-hmm. about just actual absorption of all of these compounds into the bloodstream and how they impact the infant. You know, and the other thing to remember is that because vaping liquid and e-cigarettes are not like cigarettes, you kind of aren't really, that there's actually a higher amount of nicotine. And so a lot of times, and you know, you could get a lot more nicotine from say a, a standard, a cartridge than you might from say a couple of cigarettes. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that there's a really easy answer there. Honestly, I suppose if 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 you're going to give me a third option, I would probably choose nicotine gum or something like that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. If you're if somebody was really nicotine addicted, um probably at least if you did that, you would at least get rid of all the other other compounds. But from what I'm hearing and this sounds uh, a little bit new to me and may maybe new to others is that nicotine itself Nicotine itself is also problematic or could be problematic yes, for develop for fetuses absolutely okay so i think that's an important point something to to be aware of um how 
important is the air quality where you grow up. So I just got back from a trip. I was in Bali and I've spent a lot of time in China over the past decade, um, not so much in the last few years due to travel restrictions. But, and, you know, I've, I've noticed that the air is noticeably different to here in Australia. I think we're, we're very, very fortunate um, here where I live. And presumably this is from the density of living, the number of cars and bikes and factories in a given area, and, and maybe the disappearance of nature. I'm curious as to how significant the quality of our air is. Do we see more lung disease in parts of the world where the air quality is lower? So they've tried to do uh, epidemiologic studies to try to answer this question. You know, obviously the best thing would be a randomized control trial, but nobody's mm. going to drop somebody into, <laughs> right. into some kind of polluted air tank and watch what happens over after 10 years. So, uh, but the epidemiologic studies we do have suggest that uh, exposure, chronic exposure to bad air and, and living in cities where there's higher uh, air pollution uh, contributes to the incidence of chronic lung disease as well as exacerbations of pre-existing lung disease. So um, some examples of that are, you know, children that live in urban environments. There's even data to suggest that when schools are near freeways, children have worse lung function and it actually improves when the playgrounds are moved. So I, I think absolutely. And, you know, to be honest, one of the most interesting pieces of data for me that came out of the pandemic was actually some data uh, looking at wildfire exposures in uh, the American West. So we had this very unique moment in time where we had a real measurable exposure, right? The wildfires, we knew there was an increase in particulate matter in the air. And at the same time, we had a bad thing that everybody was, was paying attention to and could actually measure, and that was COVID-19. And they found that in the exposed area, there was almost 20,000 excess cases of COVID than they would have predicted and almost an excess 1,000 deaths. And wow. to me, that's just fascinating, right? Because, I, you know, there had been suggestions before this that air pollution could increase the risk for lung infections, but we've never been able to measure it in such a, a sort of this natural experiment in such a precise way. And so what it suggests to me is that that even when we're not talking about like full-blown lung disease, what it suggests to me is that even brief exposures to bad air are probably causing uh, measurable amounts of lung inflammation that could even just in the short term put you at increased risk for things like mm. respiratory infection. So I think that uh, probably there's, for all of us, there are days where our, we've got a little bit of lung inflammation kind of coming and going. Mm. And hopefully, you know, the body takes care of that once the exposure is removed. But definitely chronic exposures are going to put you at increased risk for lung disease. I've got a question and it may be a little silly. Uh, so forgive me. But I'm curious. So actually, first, let's define particulate matter. That might be something that, that someone's hearing for the first time. I see it now in the literature quite a bit, and, and I'm seeing it being used uh, in various papers looking at cardiovascular disease risk. What is par particulate matter by definition? So uh, particulate matter is essentially uh, anything that is uh, sort of floating around in the air, dust-like particles that uh, potentially uh, could get inhaled and deposit into the lung. The size of, of the, the particles uh, actually uh, 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 dictates where in the lung it lands. And generally speaking, the smaller the particle, the deeper into the lungs that it lands as a general mm -hmm. rule. And, you know, if you read any literature on particulate matter, which is literature kind of abbreviated PM, um, you'll see they'll talk about PM10, which are things 10 microns or less, PM2.5, 2.5 microns or less. Um, and so you'll, you know, the, when you see studies, they'll look at various types of things that can cause air pollution and, and those various things can, you know, have, you know, different, different sizes. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, like I said, the larger particles tend to, to land and deposit more centrally. And sometimes it's actually those smaller particles that we worry about even more because they do get taken up into a deeper part of the lung. Mm -hmm. And so my, my silly question was, 
and I'm not sure whether it is so silly, you can tell me, but these these different particles, and you, you mentioned deposit, do they land in our lungs and some of them stick and they stay there or do they come through in a transient manner and cause inflammation, but our body clears these compounds from our lungs? Oh, that's a great question. So these larger ones that like land in your nose, like the PM10 or, you know, or eyes or throat, those we probably cough up and and get rid of. The smaller ones that land deep in the lung, it really, I think, depends. Believe it or not, some of these really small particles actually go into the bloodstream and can cause circulatory issues as well. They Some of them go really deep. Other particles, depending on the particle, some of them the body can actually uh, fight, absorb, eat, destroy. But what's really interesting, part of the research that I do actually uh, is to study lung structure and compare it against CT scans. And so I have actually taken out a lot of lungs and looked at both quote unquote healthy lungs and diseased lungs and, you know, had them in my hands. And what is shocking is that even for say a quote unquote healthy lung, which would typically be pink, there are still little black marks pretty much all over the place because there is a certain amount of like carbon deposits, et cetera, that the body just never actually is able to get rid of. And they just kind of get pushed to the side. And depending on, you know, obviously there's some of those particles that really do cause a lot of of obvious damage, like asbestos, uh, that the body really, you know, Mm. is really inflammatory. So it just kind of depends on the the particles. Some of them are more inert and the body just pushes them aside and they probably don't cause a lot of issues. Um, But some of them, the body can't get rid of and they're quite inflammatory Mm. uh, and can cause problems. So it really kind of depends on the particle. But you are absolutely right that, that, you know, I can just tell you from my own personal experience, looking at lungs that come out of bodies that that there a, a lot of the stuff that we breathe in really just stays there. So asbestos is is one of those kind of examples where it only takes a single or a, you know a, a handful of exposures to then result in in disease. Can you kind of explain what happens with asbestos? We hear about it quite a bit, but am, am I right that you have this exposure and it might just be one occasion, but then you know. 10, 20 odd years down the track, you develop mesothelioma. Is that, is that kind of so what as, happens? Uh, inhaling asbestos or these, these small, very highly irritating particles can do a couple of, of things. They can cause inflammation in the lung and cause scarring, and we call that asbestosis. Um, sometimes um, it causes these the body to make a kind of a pretty exuberant reaction, and um, particularly along the outside lining of the lung called the pleura. And you can get these things on CT scans that we call pleural plaques. Um, and they're, they're, I guess, some, probably somewhat calcified as to why they show up so bright on the CT scan. Those are not harmful, but they're sort of a very, if you see them, it's a very characteristic telltale sign that someone has been exposed to asbestos. And then I think the most concerning thing is that, uh, uh, in some patients, um, they can actually develop a cancer in the lining of the lung, which, uh, which you just mentioned, the mesothelioma, which is highly, um, unfortunately, it's um, pretty fatal. Uh, so now, now that's not every patient that's exposed to asbestos. Sure. That's, that's sort of the worst, the worst case scenario, but something we would definitely monitor for if we, if we know that a patient has been exposed. Continuing on this discussion about air quality, uh, what's the, the kind of best way of understanding the air quality in the area that you live? Is there a, an, an index that's kind of universally accepted that someone could look up to determine the air quality in their environment? Well, you know, I was just thinking about this because I always tell people about this reference, but I have to admit, I haven't looked to see what it does outside the country. Uh, it's, I'm a little bit US centric. So in the United States, uh, we have something called airnow.gov. There probably mm-hmm. are similar websites in Various countries, you just got to check your own government website. But in the U.S., we have uh, something called airnow.gov, and you can essentially type in where you live. And then um, you can, you know, also get various state-of-the-air reports that kind of give you the average. But um, what I – for outdoor air pollution, for outdoor, you know, yes, so there's some stuff you can control and some stuff you can't, right? So um, you may not be able to control what city you live in. And there's going to be some cities that are better and other cities that are worse. But maybe you can control where your house is 
in the city and maybe you don't want to be sort of near a freeway or in a you know uh, n- you know near a lot of, of traffic if you can if you can help it mm-hmm. um, but there are other things you can do like um, Uh, If it's a really bad air quality day, maybe that isn't the day that you decide to run the marathon or do all that outdoor work in your yard, or you, you know, maybe that's the day you run the recirculate on your car and that don't necessarily, you know, yes, we all love fresh air, but maybe that's not the day to get all the fresh air into your car or the Mm -hmm. outdoor air into your car. So, so I think there are some things, you know, just common sense. And as well as, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's important for city planners as well to think about, you know, you don't want schools near freeways, for instance, you can also adapt, like adopt, have schools adopt anti-idling policies, um, which I don't know about Australia, but here during during the pandemic, the school lines have gotten really long, <laughs> mm. and uh, uh, as as parents wait for kids, so um, but you know, trying to not have people just sit and idle their cars for hours, um, you know, it can also uh, you know help to reduce. So I think again, I get that people are not going to be able to completely control that, uh, but there are some things that might be under people's control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen some cities as well sort of designing green cities with more trees in in and amongst the kind of urban uh, areas and on the air quality piece i've got some friends that that live in china now and i, I know that um you know just as we would get a weather standard weather report they get a very much the get an quality air, air quality yeah, report yeah, yeah, yeah. and to your point about running that's something that they take quite seriously they are always checking what the air quality is like before they um, go and do that outside. Um, I'd actually be interested in whether anyone's looked at the blue zones. I'm sure you've heard of them, but I'd be interested yeah. to know what the air quality is like or was historically in those five areas. I, I think that would I be pretty know. interesting. Oh, I've never looked at it. It's a great question, mm-hmm. though. Now you've got me curious. I may have to look it up afterwards, but I, I don't know the answer to that off the, yeah. off the top of my head. What about within your home? So ventilation or any sort of filtration, is any of that worth looking at? So it's funny, I, you know, this is not something that was well covered or at all covered in medical school. So, <laughs> but it, but again, I, so I've, uh, this is a lot of some of the research that I, uh, I did for the book and I've actually taught myself quite, quite a bit uh, since then. But there, so there's a lot of stuff in the home that you need to be aware of. Um, probably, uh, not necessarily the most frequent, but something that pe- everybody needs to be on uh, needs to be on everyone's ra- uh, radar is radon. Radon is a leading cause of lung cancer, and if you live in a home that's never been checked for radon, um, there are easy send away kits. Most local governments help with that. Um, just check your local health department, but. Uh, that is one thing all homes should be checked for radon. Um, but other th- otherwise, you know, in the home there are a couple of key, uh, I guess, bad actors. Um, one of them is uh, uh, stoves and furnaces. So wood burning stoves in particular, I don't know how, how, how common are those in Australia? I'm curious. Maybe you don't have them. It depends but we have them where in you the live. US. Depends yeah. where you live. Yeah. So uh, in, I grew up with a wood burning stove in my home. Again, I, I grew, in a, grew up in a cold rural area. Mm-hmm. So it was mm-hmm. pretty common because it's a cheaper way to supplement for heat for the winter. Uh, but uh, it, you know, even there are, you, you know, if you've got to, if you really have to use a wood burning stove, uh, you want to make sure you have sort of the the latest and greatest, most environmentally friendly version possible. But to be honest, even those um, are going to still spill particulate matter um, in, into the environment. Um, so so that's one thing to think about. But even, uh, even um, gas stoves uh, in, you know, and I actually, ha- I have a gas powered range. Uh, so oh. I uh, have, I try to, as best I can, be super diligent about turning the exhaust fan on, even when I'm not cooking something smoky. If I've got the range on, I really do try try to run uh, the exhaust. Another real bad actor in homes are VOCs, so volatile organic chemicals, which can be very irritating to the lungs. And they can be hiding everywhere, paints, carpets, uh, all sorts of things. So I've uh, 
try to uh, become more conscious of that in my home. There are fortunately are now low and no VOC paints that are pretty readily available. Uh, but like, for instance, I'm going through a remodel in my basement right now, and I've asked them to air all the carpets out before they get installed into the home um, to mm. try to let them off gas before they actually get brought into the home. Uh uh, I do I do not run a HEPA filter in every room, but I do run one in the bedroom uh, because that is the room that we spend the most amount of mm -hmm. time. What's that uh, called in. again? Oh, sorry, a HEPA filter. So okay. you can get by like air filters for the home. I think it would be uh, a pretty big endeavor to, to run a portable one every, every single room in your home. But I do run one in the bedroom because we that's the one room we probably, you know, we sleep and you probably spend half mm -hmm. your life in the bedroom, right? So I figured that's sort of, for me, that was the decision that I made personally. It was sort of a, uh, to me, that kind of just, you know, made sense. Mm -hmm. But but those, yeah, those are some of the things that you, you really need to think about. I had a, a ding in my surfboard recently and that happens every now and then and you take it to get repa repaired. Oh, there's, right. There's people that specialize in doing that. And the guy who repairs the board, he works in a very small garage and uh. he uses this polyester kind of resin. And the, the, the best way for me to describe the smell of this is like the most potent glue um, paint that you've ever smelled right, in your like life. Right, like or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so strong. It was enough to really, it gave me a headache within a matter of minutes when I dropped it off. And my question here is, so how important is our perception of smell when we are coming into contact with a compound? So in this instance, the resin, it smells terrible. And my immediate thought intuitively is that this cannot be good for my lungs. <laughs> but But on the other hand, perfume can smell great, but I'm also still left thinking, hmm, despite this smelling great, is this really good for me to be inhaling? So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, on this and, and whether when we do come in contact with the smell, is there any way of sort of determining is that uh, harmful for us or kind of any clues? So I have not seen any research suggesting that smell equates with harm necessarily. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, it, it is funny that you say that because honestly, it's kind of, to me, I, I, it's sort of the common sense approach that I've adopted because if something, I, just even from an evolutionary perspective, right? Yeah. There, it has to develop for some reason. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to tell people is, so I like to go out and garden a lot. And, uh, but I, I'll, I try to garden with gloves on because, uh, otherwise it's just a real pain in the neck to get dirt out from underneath my fingernails and everything else. Right. But we don't really have a glove equivalent for the lungs except for a mask. So if I'm doing something in the home that smells bad or is kicking up a lot of dust, I really just try to think about it like the gloves because there, I can't really wash. So if there is something that smells funny, I should either avoid it or investigate it to get rid of it. Um, and now that we have masks available, like, well, I don't know about there, but I still have tons of masks sitting around the house. Sure. So, so I've, because I have so many of them, you know, when I go to clean out my dusty garage or my basement or something like that, I'm a lot more mindful of just, why not just throw it on? It's just for like the hour or two that you're going to be kicking up all this dust because there is a certain percentage of that that I'm never going to get back out of my lungs. I cannot wash them the way that I can. So my my hands. And so I do think that there is sort of one. Of, I just tell people, just use your common sense. If something's dusty or smells bad, it probably isn't good for you. Uh, but I, that is not necessarily mm technically science-based, but I, I think it, to me, sure. it just rings true from a common sense perspective. Yeah. It's a precautionary approach. It sounds sensible to me. Um, with the mask though, what what kind of mask are we talking about here? I guess you mentioned before, there's all sorts of different types of uh, sizes of compounds. And, you know, I've got some masks that I think really are not doing that much. And then I've got <laughs> other, other ones that have come from a uh, hospital and, and right. are are a bit um, probably doing a, a better, more thorough job. Is there some sort of mask um, specs 
that we should be looking at if we are going to to use one. Right. Well, if you really want to filter out the small harmful particles, you really have to wear an N95. Um, Mm -hmm. One thing that people may not realize is one of the things that makes the N95s at the hospital different than what, you know, all the ones that we've been all purchasing for the pandemic. It's not just the filtration, it's the fit. So when we're in the hospital, uh, I get put in a hood. They have, sometimes they'll have different sizes uh, to make sure that it absolutely is fitting the, the face perfectly. But also I, well, you get put in a hood and they spray saccharin mist at you for 10 minutes and wait for you to taste it uh, to see if if the mask is truly actually filtering out every single thing it's supposed to. And so um, I think in many instances, the the ones that we have at home is not that they're not necessarily um, high, you know, the, the filter part isn't good. It's just that they're probably not designed to, to fit as tightly. Having said all that, I think that, uh, you know, if your goal is to really to, to screen out the, the worst stuff, it, the, 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 the higher power, the, the better, the mask and the filtration, mm-hmm. the, the, the better. So, um, you know, if you're just, if it's just a little bit of dust and something, it may not matter so much, but if you really are trying to protect yourself, particularly if you're going outside and, you know, there's a lot of, um, really, unfortunately, you really do kind of need that N95. So, you know, it, I, in some instances, that's not super tolerable for lots of it, for all activities, but I will, since I have so many of them in the house, I will throw them on for brief periods of time. If there's something that toxic ish that I'm dealing with. You mentioned that unlike your hands, when they get a little bit dirty, you can wash them. It's a little bit harder with the lungs. Is there any type of breathing exercise or anything out there that does serve as a sort of quote unquote cleanse or a way of um, reducing or removing some of these particles if you've been in, in an environment where there is a lot of pollution? So the lungs do have some cleaning mechanism so that the airways are lined with hair cells that we call cilia and they kind of sweep, they kind of beat, uh, you know, almost like, I don't know if you're watching like plants on the bottom of an ocean or something like that. They do, they do kind of beat in unison and, and uh, particles will get trapped in the mucus and ultimately make it up to the central part of the airway so you can cough them out. But when they get trapped into the super deep part of the lungs, you know, past the hair cells, it doesn't work as well. There is not no one specific thing that I'm aware of besides coughing the stuff that gets up high enough that you can cough it out that's really necessarily going to help. What I will say, though, uh, and and I think this is relevant probably not so much for your average healthy individual and is a little bit more relevant maybe for that for individuals that maybe aren't as mobile. Um, But one of the things that exercising does for us, just exercising in general, Mm -hmm. is that you do take big, deep breaths, right? And so so when we do CAT scans on patients, um, it is not uncommon to see parts of the lung that look a little bit more squished, particularly in the back and the lower parts. And, um, you know, and it might be because a patient was sitting in one position a little bit too long or just not taking good deep breaths. We call that atelectasis when there's certain parts of the lungs that just aren't well aerated and a little bit squished. And so I do think it's just healthy. One of the reasons why exercise is healthy, I think, for everyone is that it does get all, you know, you do take these really large, good kind of deep cleansing breaths as you're running or, or whatever, and and making sure you really want oxygen and air getting into all parts of the lungs so that there aren't parts that aren't, you know, getting air and then they can like breed infection and things like that. So, you know, there's actually, speaking of exercise, there's actually some really interesting information. So we've been talking a lot about defensive strategies, but there actually is some data that exercise is an offensive strategy. So there was uh, data from this study called Cardia that was published by the National Institutes of Health, and they showed that peak aerobic exercise capacity measured in young adulthood was predictive of uh, better lung function in later adulthood. And in fact, if you maintained or increased your aerobic capacity throughout adulthood, that was even better. <laughs> a better, it showed those people had even better lung capacity later in life. And so it is possible that one explanation is those people just were bitter, 
bigger, better, fitter, stronger, and therefore, uh, you know, we're able to open up their lungs better and do the test better. Uh, but the other theory is that there is something about exercise that actually is anti-inflammatory uh, mm -hmm. and that actually may be, um, uh, you know, promoting lung health over time. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it is interesting that exercise may be a way of, of promoting lung health, actually. Is there any other offensive strategies while we're on that that we haven't spoken about that you would like to draw people's attention to? I wish I had. I wish I had more. <laughs> But this is this is kind of where we're at with the with the research right now. It is an act a really active area of research, and we're starting to get uh, get more and more data. So I would say maybe the only other thing would be you know just like I said, there is some soft evidence on Mediterranean diet, so that and exercise, which I think are good for all sorts of health, right? It's not sure. just it's not just it's not just the lungs. It just turns out that the lungs does also benefit, mm -hmm. or the lungs do okay. also benefit. I think we finish here just with a little bit more of a focus on COPD. Okay. Given that it is globally the, the third leading cause of death, I think you said. Um, I'm interested with the progress that we've made in terms of smoking incidents. Have we seen an overall reduction in COPD? How, how have we kind of gone over the last 50 years with regards to this condition? So the, the weird thing is that uh, dis we've actually had seen greater strides with reduction in deaths from, say, cardiovascular disease, strokes. Uh, and so what's happened is we now, people are not dying of their heart attack in their 40s or 50s. They're actually now living long enough to die of their COPD in their, you know, 60s, 70s, and mm -hmm. 80s. So we've actually seen an in relative increase in the number of deaths uh, related to chronic lung disease over the last few years. Um, I would say that smoking rates have sort of at least leveled out. So long term, mm -hmm. assuming that, that everything else is stagnant, I would, I would, would presume, uh, it won't continue to go up. Uh, but you know, you have to remember that a roughly a quarter of COPD is not related to tobacco smoke. Uh, particularly, mm -hmm. there's actually some data that uh, women in, in particular um, may be more prone to um, COPD that is not related to tobacco. So, and to the extent that that is uh, maybe ultimately contributed to by early life factors, by air pollution and things like that, with climate change and everything like that getting worse, we may see an uptick in the non and the non-tobacco related COPD. So I think it's really mm -hmm. hard. It's really hard to, to say ultimately what's, we've got, you know, some things potentially going in the right direction, but I think we have other factors going in the wrong direction mm -hmm. at the same time. What's the, the, the prognosis for someone when they're diagnosed with COPD? What does life look like? So how does, how is their life kind of made more difficult? What symptoms do they experience and, and, how much does it affect lifespan? So it really varies on the stage at which a patient is diagnosed. For patients that are diagnosed, say, relatively early, and we can help to mitigate risk factors at that point, they um, can, you know, live fairly full and, and long lives. Uh, for patients with more severe disease, I think that the two things that are, there's just many ways in which it ends up being sort of quality of life limiting. So, uh, you know, uh, patients may not be able to exercise and get out with their friends or do things that they used to. Severe patients may be attached to an oxygen tank. Other, the other issue that uh, our patients really struggle with are what we call exacerbations. So these are flare-ups of lung disease where patients sometimes need antibiotics or steroids to get the inflammation calmed down. And so those can be really debilitating and, and land people in the hospital. And so people may, we saw a lot of uh, COPD patients just not go anywhere during the pandemic because they were so afraid of, of getting exacerbations, uh, particularly due to COVID. So, um, so that impact and quality of life can be really huge. We do try to obviously help patients as best we can with combinations of both medications as well as pulmonary rehabilitation, which is an exercise program that is um, designed very specifically for patients with COPD. Uh, I, you know, yes, they, there is a shortened lifespan, but honestly, I, I, I do have a lot of patients that are able to live um, 
quite a long time, actually, perhaps surprisingly uh, long amount of time. But the thing that I struggle with most as a physician and, and in fighting for the most is to try to figure out how do I make the time that they have the best quality? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we improve the quality of life for patients? Uh, and, and so, you know, to be honest, it's not... Uh, uh, while there's, you know, people like me that are, and others, of course, that are, are doing research, it's not received uh, as much funding. And, and unfortunately, lately, what I'm also seeing is um, due to a lot of regulatory hurdles, um, it's not as profitable, perhaps, for some pharma companies. And so it's uh, um, the um, pharmaceutical industry is actually um, not investing as heavily uh, mm. for new treatments. So it's not a death sentence for patients in any way, shape, or form. So if we have somebody listening out there and they say, oh, gosh, I've just been diagnosed with COPD or I have a family member or loved one, don't panic. <laughs> we, yeah. you know, we, ha we have treatments, we have things that, that can help. And, and I do have patients that I've cared for for 20 years. This is jogging my memory. So my undergraduate degree, I, was, I did physiotherapy and I actually spent some time working in uh, hospitals, and some of the patients that I was um, working with had emphysema. And um, so I saw firsthand what that was like. And, and that can make exercise particularly hard at times. Um, am I right? Emphysema is a type of COPD. And if, if, if I am remembering that correctly, um, what is it that, that kind of dictates whether someone with COPD goes on to develop em emphysema? So that's a really great question. So COPD is really, it's a, com we make that diagnosis based on uh, risk, risk factors and then kind of this um, airflow obstruction pattern that we see on the pulmonary function testing that's sort of a permanent airflow obstruction or air kind of limitation in getting air out. It can be in any one patient, a combination though of the airways being closed tight and scarred or the air stacks being destroyed, which is what we call emphysema. So most patients have a little bit of both, uh, both uh, the airway inflammation and, and destruction as well as uh, the emphysema. But uh, I, what I would say is that of the two types of abnormalities, it tends to be the emphysema that's a bit more scary uh, because uh, once the lung starts, the lung almost develops a moth-eaten appearance. And it actually may even be some of the stretching and mechanical factors such that once it's like it's developed a weakness. And so the, the, the more it, the infrastructure is weakened, it can develop, you know, almost like more tearing. Um, and so we are finding emphysema begets emphysema. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be massively rapidly progressive in all patients. But once patients do start to have emphysema develop, it does tend to be progressive in some form. And, and it's, it's problematic for two reasons. One, because the lungs really have like the, the surface area of like a tennis court. But once you eat away, it's like the difference between a makeup sponge and a loofah. <laughs> once you eat away at that surface area, it just can't exchange gas as well. But the second problem is that you're losing the integrity of the lung and that infrastructure. And so the nice tight rubber band like function of the lung is destroyed and the lungs become too big and they become floppy and the air gets trapped and then you lose that mechanical advantage when you're breathing that we talked about. So it's that it's both of those things that really cause um, patients to become short of breath and exercise capacity to be limited. Okay. So to round this one out, if we're thinking about kind of trying to squeeze out lung conditions out of our society, and, and I think we might need to get you back on for a round two, we could probably dedicate an entire episode to asthma, for example. We haven't really touched on that too much. Um, but if we're thinking about kind of just trying to squeeze out chronic lung conditions from our societies, really reduce them down to as low as possible, other than you know tackling climate change, addressing the way that our cities are developed and um, city planning, et cetera, on an individual level, if we were to kind of summarize what we've spoken about, You've spoken about the importance of diet. There's some evidence to support a Mediterranean diet for healthy lung development in utero and early in life. You spoke about the importance of exercise. You spoke about being aware of air quality. And also, if you're working around any sort of potential contaminants, um, thinking about a, a mask, wearing a mask, an N95 preferably. You spoke about um, filtration at home as a potential um, 
tool or um, device that you could use to improve the air quality in your home. And then you also spoke about trying to avoid smoking both through yourself and, and secondhand smoke. Is there anything else that you would kind of add to that list of, of um, things that you would like people to think about generally with regards to uh, protecting their lung function? I think probably the most important other thing that we, that we didn't touch on much with is just vaccinations. So mm-hmm. for children, there's a ton of vaccinations, but I think we also forget that in adulthood, there are still vaccinations that um, can help, you know, uh, obviously COVID is in front uh, is front and center in everyone's mind, but there's also influenza uh, vaccinations for some older adults. They may need pneumococcal vaccinations and even things like shingles can actually impact the lungs. So, so, just kind of, you know, talking to your doctor and making sure you're getting all of the age appropriate vaccinations can, and your children as well can also be a really important strategy. That's really helpful. Um, thank you so much for making the time to do this conversation. Um, once again, congratulations on your new book, Breathing Lessons. It's great. I really recommend that everyone goes out and, and gets a copy. I'll put a link to that into the show notes along with a link to your website. And if folks would like to connect with you on the socials, where's the the best place for them to find you? Uh, so I, as you mentioned, my website is drmalenhan.com, but I'm on almost all of the uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube if, if they want to look for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.